There are over 13,000 cards for duelists to create the perfect deck. Many of those cards made their very first appearance in the anime, but for some they would never cross the bridge to the physical card game. Have these cards been lost to time, or are they far too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? The time has come to answer these questions once and for all. Duel Monsters is over. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Alexis and Atticus Rhodes, Bay and Bay's brother, I guess. It wasn't intentional, but these episodes are starting to look like one of Drake's diss tracks. I'll be honest, I set myself up for disappointment with how much I hyped up Atticus in my mind with him being one of the duelists lost to the old abandoned dorm, and then he turned out to be a bit of a goober. I'm also still not entirely sure if Alexis and Atticus were meant to be a likeness to Joey and Serenity, but if that's what they were going for, I think the writers were a bit confused. With Atticus sporting some of Joey's iconic cards and upgrades to the original Red Eyes Black Dragon, but Alexis very clearly being the better duelist. I don't really know what they were going for. Nonetheless, they achieved some pretty solid characters. And with that said, getting into their anime exclusive cards from the series is pretty interesting because Alexis brings a playstyle unlike any other and Atticus, well, Atticus has some of the cards of all time. They're more so interesting because they function under the context of some notable cards and their original anime effects. But let's start off with Miss Rhodes. I hope you all packed a jacket or something warm because we're kicking off with Alexis's ice steam deck from her Society of Light phase. Turns out it was just a phase, Mom. Cold Sleeper is a level 4 water machine effect monster with 1100 attack and 800 defense, and this monster's effect can be activated while face up on the field. When a monster you control is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can select one of your unused monster card zones. And if you do, special summon the destroyed monster at the end of the battle phase. That monster cannot change its battle position, and the selected monster card zone cannot be used during this duel. It's a very unique form of floating, I can give it that much. It's also a non-once per turn and is nearly instantaneous, which is a plus as well. But what I want us to keep in mind is the very last effect. We'll see this effect repeated a few times in Alexis's cards where they basically freeze her own monster zones. Considering that you have to control this monster to apply the effect, but if it is removed from the field in any way, your zone is still frozen for the round, I'm a bit apprehensive to say the least. Assuming that this would account for the extra monster zone as well, we still only have 5 zones to work with, which of course is diminished with every summon. I won't pass judgment until we see the remaining cards, but a card and effect like this needs a lot of help to be viable. A pillar to hold them up, or a sculpture of sorts, like Illusion Ice Sculpture. How fitting. It's a level 1 light rock effect monster with zero attack and defense. Okay, rock monster, good stuff, bring back block dragon, all that. And when this card is summoned, target one face-up monster you control. This card's attack and defense become equal to that monster's original attack and defense. While this card is face-up on the field, other monsters you control cannot be selected as attack targets, and there can only be one face-up illusion ice sculpture on the field. Marauding Captain and Solar Flare Dragon would be ashamed of this. It's obvious what it's trying to do though. Summon Cold Sleeper, then summon Illusion Ice Sculpture. How are you doing that? I'm not sure, but do that first. Now, Sculpture redirects attacks towards Sleeper to itself, which then triggers Sleeper's effect to revive Sculpture at the end of the battle phase. Disregarding the hoops we had to jump through to get these two cold ones on board, we haven't really cracked anything open other than a neat little combo. Which, might I add, is limited to four uses maximum, because with each revival of Sculpture, Sleeper locks one of your monster zones, and that's only if you are strictly sticking to the quote-unquote lockdown between these two monsters. Monsters. That's also ignoring the all too real fact that non-battle removal is very much a thing that is probably more prevalent than battle destruction. Like I've stated in a previous episode, if cards could be retroactively added to pre-existing formats, they would have far more room to be experimented with and find their niche. Today, Friday, September 20th, this ain't gonna cut it, Chief. What if I told you, though, that this combo could be made even further limited by adding another card? I guess that kind of goes without saying, but next we have Icicle Sacrifice, a normal spell card that upon activation has you select one of your unused monster card zones. Can't say I like where this is going. Special summon one Icicle token, Aquatype, Water, level 1, with zero attack and defense. That selected monster card zone cannot be used during this duel, and the Icicle token can be treated as two tributes for the tribute summon of a monster. 
I can also see what they're going for with this. You're essentially giving up the Monster Zone as the second tribute. What do you think about this Mobius the Frost Monarch? <laughs> oh, you think it sucks? I agree wholeheartedly. Hell, I can say without hesitation that this card wouldn't be made any better by including the modern extra deck, for example, treating itself as two level one materials for a synchro monster and or treating itself as two materials for a link monster whilst also giving up a main monster zone. I don't know much, but if there is anything that I'm certain of in this world is that Alexis's ice deck is the matchup that every cash Tira player dreams of. They're quite literally doing half of the work for them. Good thing too because my Shangri was getting very tired of carrying the deck. The winter continues to get harsher though and I live in the north so I know a thing or two about cold things. They don't tie into the freezing shenanigans of our previous entries but the next two cards are at least thematically in line with this series of cards dressing up as an archetype for Halloween. Snow Fairy is a level 4 light fairy effect monster with 1100 attack and 700 defense. While this monster is face up on the field, your opponent cannot activate spell cards from their hand, nor activate spell cards during the turn they are set. What, I don't have to freeze one of my unused spell and trap zones every time they set a card? I'm bewildered. Who would have thought that dropping terrible effects can result in a really good card? Without the zone locking, Snow Fairy actually addresses one of the glaring issues for the sculpture and sleeper lock surprisingly well. Turning nearly all of your opponent's spell cards into slower, normal trap cards helps to mitigate that non-battle removal that lock breaks so easily to. As good as that is, don't forget that having Fairy on the field takes away another use of sleeper's effect. It also doesn't completely stop spell cards, just slows them down considerably. Make no mistake, that Rikeki is still going to blast you back to Slay for Red on the next turn. The last card in the series has absolutely nothing to do with everything we've talked about thus far, and I feel like it either has nothing to do with them outside of aesthetic, or I'm completely missing something because this comes out of left field and I'm not talking about the Pendulum Zone. White Blizzard is a continuous spell card that on a non-once-per-turn effect, burns your opponent for 600 damage if their monster is destroyed by battle. When this card is destroyed, select one card you control and destroy it. Let's break this down. Non-once per turn burn damage? Nice. Triggers when your opponent's monster is destroyed by battle. Great, it's probably the second easiest way to remove those monsters from the field. Takes one of your cards with it when it's destroyed? <sighs> you ruined it. Okay, it's not all that bad. I'm still confused as to where this effect came from, but if it were tied into the rest of Alexis's ice cards, it would have locked every unused zone on your side of the field when destroyed. We should just count our blessings before Konami makes that a reality. So, the ice deck is something special. Unironically, this reminds me of the ice counter deck. Not in a bad way, but also not in a good way. They're both equally useless. I'm just not sure what you'd want to run this with. They are light and water monsters. That's not a real thing, let alone the fact that half of your field is unusable. So let's transition to more generic cards from Alexis. Angel Blast is a normal trap card which can only be activated when your opponent activates an effect that destroys a monster card. Negate the activation and effect of that card and destroy it. Sometimes, simple is best. Your opponent tries to destroy something, you stop them from doing so. It's the Yu-Gi-Oh! Our Caveman Ancestors intended for us to play. However, having this card tied to Alexis makes me hate it because it only reinforces the idea for someone to make Sculpture Sleeper Stall a thing. But aside from that, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. There are just better options that cover a wider scope of cards and effects that can be responded to in the same manner that this card responds to cards and effects. And the same thing can be said about Pure Pupil, a counter trap card that can only be activated when your opponent activates the effect of an effect monster while you control a monster with 1000 or less attack. Negate that effect and destroy that monster. This is just Divine Wrath with a different condition for its negate. Divine Wrath is undoubtedly better because discarding a card will always be a more feasible condition to meet than controlling a monster that needs to meet specific criteria or just controlling a monster in general. At least Pure Pupil's artwork is kind of cool, although it doesn't work at all with an actual alien deck. Not the good ones, that is. On the subject of better options, how about Allegro Toil? Ooh, fancy. It's a quick play spell card that can be activated when you normal summon a monster. Target one spell or trap card your opponent controls and destroy it. You can almost... <sighs> 
smell the limited MST format that this would have came out in. We need this car to be imported to the physical game. Because it's better than Mystical Space Typhoon? Absolutely not. Because the game is reaching the precipice where normal summoning is becoming an outdated mechanic of the game. I have zero doubts that in a few years, maybe even sooner, every new tier 1 archetype going forward won't even use their normal summon because their 3 to 4 starter card options can special summon themselves for no cost. Taking off the tinfoil hat, the card is mediocre on a good day. No one is going to tech double summon with toil when we have cards like Galaxy Cyclone and Twin Twisters. It's just not going to happen. I mean, at this point, I don't have a lot of faith in Alexis's anime cards. When I said that her playstyle was unlike any other, hopefully you didn't take that to mean that it was good because you set yourself up for disappointment and I can relate. So, let's just power through her final three cards. Angel Wing is an equipped spell card that burns 300 damage to your opponent each time the equipped monster inflicts battle damage to your opponent. It's basically an LOB level of attack boosting, but worse because it's burn damage so this needs to be attached to an already strong monster if you want to be able to reliably use the burn effect. If anything, you should run this card solely for its second effect. When this face up card is sent to the graveyard, draw one card. Beautiful. It's giving Bamboo Sword and Riz Ohio, or whatever my kids are showing me on TikTok. I actually like the card just for this effect. Next is Prima Light, a quick play spell card allowing you to special summon one Cyber Prima from your hand by sending one face-up Cyber 2-2 you control to the graveyard. You've found yourself in quite a pickle if this is a viable option. By no means is it a useless effect. I'd much rather have Prima on the field over 2-2, but to get Prima on the field, I would want to tribute summon her, which is the only way she gets her effect to destroy all face-up spell cards on the field. That's right, your Swords of Revealing Light and Nightmare Steel Cage are powerless against my hentai alien ballerina. That's not a sentence I ever thought I would say. Anyways. White Knight Fort, Alexis's final anime exclusive, is a continuous spell card and while face up on the field, neither player can activate trap cards during their opponent's turn. Alright, first turn, no imperm. I like it. That also means that I can't imperm on my opponent's turn, so this sucks? Clearly I'm conflicted on this card, but I think that most players would agree that this adds a very interesting balance to the game. Or would that be imbalanced, because now I can't slow my opponent down with interruptions, but they also can't slow me down with interruptions, which in turn makes the game even faster, but now all of our Imperms, Solemns, and Ice Dragon Prisons are dead, ultimately rendering both of our decks even worse, which ends up slowing down the game, I think, but the game also gets sped back up because now Mirror Force can't be used and I can punch through my opponent without repercussions, but who even plays trap cards anymore? What is a trap card? What is a trap? Well, now my head hurts, and that's how I know that Alexis is perfect for me. Her cards, uh, not so much. Surely the cards of one Atticus Rhodes couldn't be any worse, right? Right? Attachment Dragon is a level 1 Wind Dragon effect monster with 100 attack and defense. When this card is summoned, okay, you have my attention. Equip this card as an equipped card to a monster your opponent controls. Once per turn, you can change that monster's battle position. What the fuck is that? How much more useless could you possibly get? And if anyone said vanilla monsters, I'm gonna need you to go play a different game. Because at the very least, vanillas have a plethora of generic support that a level 1 dragon monster could make excellent use of. This, on the other hand, is like... What? The fuck is that? Unless you're facing the 1 in 100 duel against a Morphtronic player, or to give this card as much credit as it doesn't deserve, the 1 Vintage Battery Men player, monsters still get their effects regardless of their battle position. And it's not as though this monster permanently changes their battle position, it changes it on the turn you activate the effect, which is not a quick effect, so that would be your turn only. And that's putting more faith than I have available that the effect won't get negated on the spot and you end up wasting your normal summon. But that is also putting a lot of faith in the idea that a player would waste their precious negate on a goddamn attachment dragon. Fittingly, we've wasted far too much time trying to make a case for this card, so let's move on to a set of cards that I'm a bit more interested in, bringing back a Joey classic with the mighty Panther Warrior. His journey begins on the path to destiny, an equip spell card which can only be equipped to a beast warrior monster, it can attack your opponent directly. I like this one, and to be fair, the two reasons I like it is because the combination of panther warrior with scapegoat is iconic, and everything else we've looked at so far fails in comparison, even for how basic this card is. Disregarding my personal bias, it's probably not getting teched into fire fists, 
Tri Brigade, or Zodiac so I can sleep peacefully at night. On Panther Warrior's journey down the path, he is faced with a legendary battle. That he loses, so I'm confused as to where the next card's name comes from. Miracle Moment, a normal trap card that can only be activated when a Panther Warrior you control equipped with Path to Destiny is destroyed by battle. Special summon one Bronze Warrior from your hand or deck. Seems like they were kinda going for a sequel to the Gear Freed story, but this won't be a New York Times bestseller anytime soon. The special summon is fine, and we'll talk about that monster in a moment, but the requirements are a bit too specific. Needing Panther Warrior as opposed to the Any Beast Warrior that Path to Destiny can be equipped to, then needing said Panther Warrior to be equipped with said Path to Destiny, then needing said Panther Warrior to be destroyed by battle is asking a whole lot for just a simple special summon. I could accept all of these requirements if it were a spell card that functioned about the same as Release Restraint, we could even still include Path to Destiny. Are those requirements worth it? Bronze Warrior is a level 4 Earth Warrior effect monster with 500 attack and 1800 defense. Once per turn, you can add one Beast Warrior monster from your deck to your hand. While this face-up card is in attack position, all Beast Warrior monsters gain 400 attack. He's got the spirit, but it's like when your little brother wants to hang out with you and your friend group. Kinda cramping our style, kid. Admittedly, the soft once per turn search any beast warrior having no other restriction on what you can search, I feel like there's gotta be something there. And the biggest dilemma is the need to either get multiple on the field at once, or find a way to cycle through one copy between your field, graveyard, and hand. I'd love to imagine the convoluted combos you'd need to pull off to really benefit from Bronze Warrior's effect, but we've got more cards to look at and it's time for the one per episode battle trap that I have to compare to the already suitable options that we have in the physical game. Cursed Ring is a normal trap card that can only be activated when your opponent's monster declares an attack. Equip this card to the attacking monster. It cannot destroy a monster by battle, but damage calculation is applied normally. I really want to hate this card, but I can't entirely compare it to something like Waboku, Negate Attack, or Threatening Roar. It's not a one-for-one -one clone with a tie-in to a character's specific deck theme, as has been the case for the previous battle traps that we've covered. It's strange because it copies only half of Waboku's effect, but continuously applies to the equipped monster, meaning your opponent has to go out of their way using a resource to get it off the field when those resources could be used for more meaningful removal. There aren't really any cards that we have today that do the same thing as this, with the one exception being Albrojos the Megaquake, a worthless Blackwing monster. <laughs> Would I still run the regular battle traps over this? In the real world, it's an overwhelming yes. Would I still run the regular battle traps over this in the anime? Well, I don't really get a choice now, do I? But if there were a card from Atticus that I would choose to run, it would be Dragon Heart. A normal spell card that sends three dragon monsters of your choice from your deck to the graveyard to target one face-up dragon monster you control. It gains 1,000 attack until the end phase of this turn. You cannot normal summon or set during the turn you activate this card. That's broken, with a capital, BRUH. 1,000 attack points is way too much. Have you seen what Acts of Despair can do? <laughs> Okay, jokes aside, what the actual heck is this nonsense? Non once per turn, triple foolish burial reserved specifically for dragon type monsters. Are you kidding me? Can't normal summon or set? Oh no, if only I had some monsters in my graveyard to use with- Oh wait, I now have three of them. Maybe I'm wrong. This might be the worst support card that dragon decks have ever had and it would never see play in a million years. You're despicable. But I suppose it's fitting for the Joey-inspired deck of Atticus Rhodes, and the next card also pays homage to Joey in his duel with Bandit Keith. Metal Plus is a continuous trap card that can be equipped to a monster you control. Negate the activations of spell cards that target the equipped monster and destroy those cards. Clearly a likeness to the original Metal Morph with a completely out-of-place relation to the effect of the original Horus monsters, so that's pretty neat. The lore goes even deeper though. Remember Red Eye's Darkness Metal Dragon? Well, it's pretty hard to forget a monster that's been an absolute menace in Dragon decks since its debut. In the anime, however, this card was big trash. No free special summons. In fact, the anime version of this monster couldn't even be special summoned from the deck like Red Eye's Black Metal Dragon. Nope, only from the hand by tributing a Red Eye's Darkness Dragon that is equipped with Metal Plus. 
This all comes full circle. It's never been a secret that playing Red Eyes Black Dragon equipped with Metal Morph is leagues ahead of playing Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon. And playing Red Eyes Darkness Dragon equipped with Metal Plus is without question better than playing the anime Darkness Metal. It's nice when the circle of card design is completed in such perfect form. It's just a shame that this was the result that we landed on. I'm gonna need you all to put on a nice rollback smile getting into the next card because we've got a two for one special in this week's episode. Offensive Guard is a normal trap card that can only be activated when your opponent's monster declares a direct attack. Have the attacking monsters attack until the end phase and draw one card. It's another party trick pretending to be a battle trap that I can compare to better cards. The draw one effect is kind of nice though, kind of like how Dark Bribe was relevant for a day. In all honesty, you could have told me that Joey played this card during Duel Monsters and I would not have questioned you at all. At this point, I'm starting to believe that Joey's soul was somehow trapped in the abandoned dorm and when Atticus escaped, Joey's soul latched onto him. Everyone thought it was Night Shroud. Spooky stuff. So let's end things off with the more lighthearted cards. The first being Spotlight, a continuous spell card that upon activation has you target one face-up monster you control. It gains 300 attack, and if the targeted monster is removed from the field, target one other face-up monster you control and apply this card's effect to it. It's not groundbreaking, that's for sure. It really would have served better as an equip spell, at least making it mildly more searchable for most decks. That also leads to the question of why? Why would you search this over any other equip card? Why would you search this over any other continuous spell card? The ability to recycle the attack boost to another monster is something. I know Guardians would love to have anything remotely like this, but only giving a flat 300 point boost is so irrelevant that it hurts. This has no reason to exist, so it's probably a card that we'll see in the physical game pretty soon. Gotta love it. And Atticus's last card, and the final card for this week, is Ultimate Stage Costume, a field spell card, and when you activate this card, target one face-up monster you control. Stay with me, I promise I'm reading the right card effect. It gains 3,000 attack and defense. If that monster attacks, its attack and defense become their original values during the damage step only. If that monster is removed from the field, target one face-up monster you control and apply this card's effect to it. All that they've done here is changed the type of spell card and added a zero to the stat boost. And just with that, they managed to create a card that is ten times better than the previous one. Field spells are far more accessible than any continuous or equipped spell card could ever hope to be. Gains 3,000 attack and defense unless it attacks? Couldn't be happier, because in a majority of board states, you now have a monster with 4,000 or more attack that your opponent will most likely need to use effect destruction on to get rid of. If they don't have that, well, they're now staring down a massive body that they can't get over. But if they do have the out, you're picking a new monster to give a massive stat boost to, and your opponent has to repeat the cycle, making ultimate stage costume a direct threat that your opponent has to respond to. Modern field spells are so crammed with effects that it makes Queso look like a kid you can donate a penny to to feed for the day. So seeing something relatively simplistic but packing a hard punch is lovely, and I will take three copies right away. After looking at the anime exclusive cards from these siblings, I'm even more confused than I was before. How in the hell was Alexis the better duelist with the dumpster fire of cards she was running? And how did Atticus ever accomplish anything? Frankly, I'll rack my brain more than it's worth trying to come up with an answer, and because that was the final card, you know what that means. It's time for the patent pending purple pineapple grading scale. I'll take the total number of cards that we covered this week and get a percentage based on how many cards that I feel are worthy of coming to the physical game. Anything 70% or above is a passing grade. Of the 21 cards we've covered this week, Alexis and Atticus Rhodes get a 38%. Yikes, that's pretty bad. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me down below. If you missed the previous episodes, you can check them out in the playlist down right here in the bottom right corner. Or if you want to check out Season 1, where we covered every anime-exclusive card from the Duel Monsters era, you can check that out in the playlist right up here. Thanks again, as always, guys, and we'll see you in the next one.